relatives here. Oops. Yeah, I've been listening to uh, some of the relatives here the last couple of days, and uh, and I was really uh, amazed and humbled, and uh, and wondering why did he ask me to talk when you had, <clears throat> you know, the uh, level of uh, presentations that you've been having are really uh, amazing, and so uh, I really appreciate uh, being a part of this, and um, just as way of ser uh, introductory. Uh, Eduardo Duran, and uh, I live in Bozeman, Montana. <clears throat> I'm part of Apache Pueblo, and I'm also a Hunka relative uh, to the Yellow Horse, Susan Yellow Horse, uh, Oglala, and, uh, and also part white. So I tell people when I, uh, <clears throat> when I talk, I say, because of my uh, genetic makeup, I try to speak for all indigenous people and for all white people. So I hope, uh, you know, you uh, you don't mind my taking privilege and doing that. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> actually, yesterday was a, a really big day for me. Uh, it was kind of the ending of my uh, <clears throat> working uh, as a day-to-day -day clinical person. And uh, what I'm going to talk about here today, um, uh, pretty much all of it comes from uh, from doing work. Uh, clinical work, therapy, healing work with our relatives, and most most of that has been in Indian country. And uh, yesterday, uh, you know, I was figuring out about how many hours I have spent um, working with our relatives over the years. And, uh, you know, over 35 years, I figured uh, probably 60,000 hours of, uh, of doing therapy with, uh, with, our, with our relatives. And so what I'm saying here today is informed by that. And uh, I'm not an academic, I'm not a professor, I'm just a, a common person who's been working uh, the best I can. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have had some teachers uh, in the uh, Indian community that have also informed uh, what I know. And, and constantly that knowledge, it continues to be um, added to, you know, like uh, listening to uh, the relatives that presented here at this conference. <clears throat> and uh, as far as uh, my uh, uh, paternal grandmother, uh, she was born in a place called Pahuake. And then uh, the other grandma <clears throat> on my dad's side, uh, Apache and Korea uh, Apache. And so, uh, you know, that's the, the lineage. Although what I'm going to say here today is, is not from any one particular tribe. And in the 60,000 plus hours that I've been working with our people, uh, I've been honored enough to, to have worked with uh, people from probably a, at least over 100 different tribes. And so, uh, I really believe, uh, you know, and especially I was uh, listening to Brother Richard Moose Camp yesterday and how he talked about how all the tribes were one at one point. I mean, somehow they got separated with language and all that. And in doing the work that I've been doing, I can agree with that. I really believe that we are still a one, one tribe. And, and, and that tribe, I believe, goes all over the world, indigenous people that have talked from other parts of the world there's a common thread that weaves us together. And, uh, and I think that colonization has been trying to inform us that we're separate, that we're so different. And, and I think that that is the tactic of, uh, of war that they've been using against indigenous people for at least over 500 years. And uh, I really believe that there's more common and in my experience, I have found that is, there's a lot more commonality than, than differences and separations. So. <clears throat> and then uh, also um, something came to me and you know, everyone has been talking about ceremony, different kinds of ceremonies from mostly Lakota way. And, uh, and this morning it came to me, I says, well, I guess I need to talk about this ceremony that we call psychotherapy. 
because uh, a lot of the, I was told that a lot of people in the audience are people that uh, <clears throat> the work as therapists, whether it's in substance abuse or uh, family counseling or something like that. And, and that is a ceremony and it has its own rules. It has its own circle, it has its own container. And so um, <clears throat> that's the ceremony that uh, I've been par participating as part of my work for, uh, for a long time. And, uh, and it's amazing how, how long I've been, I've been doing this. And so, uh, and also I told the, the people in charge there that uh, as soon as I give some, uh, a little bit of introductory remarks that if, uh, if some of you have a question or a, a comment to be able to maybe uh, say it right away so that that way, you know, if, if the discussion needs to go somewhere else, then uh, I won't be just colonizing you because if I'm just talking to you, then that's stuff that I already know. But you might want to know something different. And if you want to know something different than what I'm saying, you can ask a question or say, well, what you just said, and then you can say whatever. And, uh, and that's usually how I do uh, <clears throat> these talks with community is I like to have a conversation and of course, if nobody wants to say anything, then I'll just talk, but at least uh, give uh, the opportunity to, uh, to say that, uh, uh, you know, I just don't want to colonize you with whatever I think I have to say, which is uh, uh, pretty pitiful most of the time. And uh, Ed. Ed. yes, sir. Uh, Tanshi Richards in the crowd today, so. He's what? He's in, in the participating, he's sitting in a crowd today, so he's listening okay. to you, so just want okay. to let you know. So I better be careful what I say then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, Ben, I've known uh, Richard for a lot of years, you know, and, and a lot of teachings uh, have happened over the years, and I'm really honored uh, to know him and his family. I can also truthfully say that uh, Brother Richard's ceremony has saved uh, members of my family uh, who are here today because of uh, the prayer that he's done. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to, uh, to the connection that he has to the mystery so that he can uh, help us like that. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> one of the first uh, distinctions that I want to make here is because a lot of times, you know, um, what we read and what we're told in academia is that a lot of times therapy of whatever kind doesn't, is not that effective with native people. And, uh, and over the years, you know, I've been working with that. And, um, and one of the things that has come to me is that one of the reasons that uh, therapy sometimes misses the mark with uh, uh, native people and indigenous people is that there's a, a real difference in the, in, in the base of the language. And when I talk about language, I'm not saying that, uh, to, you know, about the native languages, but a lot of times the therapy, most of the therapy that I've done has been in English. And of course, most of you all that do therapy and have been trained, most of the training has been in English. And so uh, it's really important to make a distinction as to what English or, or the Western languages do. And, and one of the things that has been revealed to me is that in the English language, usually what carries the meaning uh, in, the, in the spoken word, the written word, is, uh, is something we call nouns. And so it's, it's uh, the objects that we're talking about. But as soon as, uh, psychologically, as soon as we, uh, we start talking in nouns, what that does is it creates a separation because in, in a Western way, in a Western mentality, uh, deep embedded into the language itself, is that as soon as we start talking, we start talking about a subject and an object. And in our training, you know, whether it's in psychology, social work, medicine, whatever, that is the premise of everything, is that, that there's me here, and then there's the world out there. And so there's a, a separation. And so when we start talking with people, whether it's in therapy or in whatever context, 
uh, there's usually a separation that happens because of the language. And, and of course, an example of that is when we say, you know, there's a woman over there, there's a man over there, or there's a tree over there. Uh, all it can be is that. And so it's, it's kind of a frozen picture in time. And, and it's really hard to change it if that's all it can be. <clears throat> and in my experience, uh, I've asked a lot of people from different tribes, from uh, different parts of the country, Canada, Mexico, also in New Zealand and Africa, I've asked uh, people who speak their indigenous languages as to what makes their language make sense in, in the world, you know, as far as uh, in, informing our awareness. <clears throat> and in most of those languages, uh, people have said that in, in their way of knowing, it's usually something that in English we know as verbs that carry the meaning. And so most indigenous languages are languages that are in movement. And, and so if it's in movement, there's not a separation that happens. And so uh, it's, it's more closely aligned to how the universe is actually wired. And uh, of course, a lot of the uh, present day quantum physics people tell us that really the universe is in motion. It's not an object that's, you know, that's separate from us. It's movement of energy that is happening. <clears throat> and so like the examples I, I said earlier, instead of saying there's a woman over there in English, we're saying there's a man over there. <laughs> in this type of, uh, of, of psychology and this type of thinking, and we would say, well, womaning is happening over there, or manning is happening over there, which is a whole different thing than saying there's a woman or there's a man. Because if there's womaning happening energetically, that can happen anywhere, it can happen here also. If there's manning happening, it can happen anywhere, it could happen here, it could happen there. And so it's a movement of energy that happens. <clears throat> And I think that's been one of the distinctions, at least in my work, that I have seen uh, has created a, uh, a difficulty in doing the, the therapy that we're trained to do in, in a Western way, which is uh, Western mentality is about being separate. And when in, uh, most indigenous ways of, of being our, our perception from that linguistic way of knowing the world is, is about being, uh, being one and, and, and not being separate from the world and the environment. And uh, one of the reasons that's really important is just the environmental stuff that we see happening today where because of, uh, of being able to noun or to objectify our world, it's possible then in that mentality to pollute or poison the world because the idea is that I'm separate from it. So if I'm polluting, let's say a river, well, that has nothing to do with me. And, 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 and of course that is a really wrong perception because it has everything to do with me. And, and I really believe that language has a lot to do with it. <clears throat> and I actually met an elder up in Canada years ago. And uh, he told me something that it's, I, I still don't, you know, there's no way I can understand what he told me. And he told me that in his language, there are no nouns. And so uh, his perception is, is pretty much purely quantum movement of energy. And, uh, and, and that's how, he's, how he lives in the world. So why is this important? Or why am I even talking about it to a bunch of therapists and, and people who do this work? Well, the, the reason it's so important, I think, is because of the diagnostic uh, tools and process that, that, that we use when we start working with our relatives. <clears throat> and, and of course, the way that we're trained is that we, um, we, we use language that is separate. And so when somebody comes to us for help, uh, let's say that they're depressed or alcoholic or addictive disorder, whatever. So the, the way that we use language then is, is we tell somebody like that, we look in our DSM-5 and we say, well, uh, you, you are a major depressive disorder 
or you are an alcoholic, or you're a diabetic, or you're whichever diagnosis <clears throat> we think, or the person, the patient thinks they have. And as soon as we do that, basically we're creating a naming ceremony for that person. Now, because of our power as a, as a therapist or whatever we are, with the words that we speak, we basically uh, give them that name of a major depressive disorder. And, and once we name them, then our relative knows what the rules are. And if you're a major depressive disorder, there's a certain way to be. And if, you're, if we say you're an alcoholic, well, that's another name. So we're naming that person. And in, in naming them, we're separating them from us. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and so uh, that's been one of the uh, revelations. So what I suggest we do, um, and, and hopefully you know, this stays with you, because my talk's going to be a little bit um, all over the place, uh, because I think being nonlinear is probably a better way than just being kind of linear. And uh, I guess a lot of you might even say that I'm being tangential because that's the fancy psychology word that we use when somebody talks the way I am. And, and, and in my uh, experience, it, it has been better for, uh, better for the patient if we don't name them. And instead, you know, instead what I, what I do, what I try to do is let's say again talking about somebody who says they're depressed instead of saying you are a major depressive disorder i will i was talking probabilities and uh, i i say maybe the spirit of sadness is visiting you or if somebody presents with an addiction let's say alcoholism whatever instead of saying you're an alcoholic i say maybe the spirit of alcohol is visiting you. And, and you can see what a difference that makes in the psychology of that individual, because if it's a probability, and if it's a visitor, that means that it's in movement. And, and, and if it's just visiting, that means that there's something you can do to shape shift it and to turn it into something else. Versus if you are the diagnosis, then it becomes really difficult to shape shift that because that's who you are. And, and that becomes a, a bigger task. And so I think that uh, <clears throat> that's been one of the, uh, at least in my observations, uh, has been one of the uh, barriers to helping uh, our relatives who, who come to see us. And, uh, you know, going back to the 60,000 hours or 35 years of work that I've been doing, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, have been in different environments. Uh, I, I've worked in tribal programs, urban programs, IHS, hospitals, and and that's what has informed uh, my ideas of what uh, I just was uh, telling you. And so, uh, hopefully, uh, I know that's way off the grid from what we learn in school, but I really think it's important to remember that and. Uh, it would really uh, blow my mind. I was working at this Indian hospital and uh, I remember seeing uh, some of the elders in the, in, the, in the waiting room and some of these elders could barely speak any English. And so here the provider would approach them, you know, whether it's a medical doctor or whatever, and start telling them what they were. And, and, and it was just, uh, my mind would just wonder, you know, what is that grandpa or that grandma? wondering what they're telling them because in their language which is a movement language it's an energetic language what that person is saying makes no sense and that's why especially in ihs um a lot of over the years uh what i heard from a lot of the providers is that native people are non-compliant and they don't take their medicine they don't they don't take their protocols and my answer to them is, well, how do you expect people to be compliant if, if they can't understand, you know, what it is that you're talking about? 
and here you are speaking in this foreign uh, way of, of understanding illness and healing <clears throat> and making them the defective individual when we need to talk in probabilities. And uh, <clears throat> interestingly enough, uh, I've had a couple of uh, high ranking uh, IHS people approach me after, and there was this one uh, physician who wore the uniform and all that. And, and after my talk, uh, he was uh, a, a doc that did a lot of diabetic work. And uh, he came and told me, and he says, uh, you know, from now on, he says, I will never diagnose my patients with diabetes. He said, uh, from now on, I'm gonna say, maybe the spirit of diabetes is visiting you, which really blew my mind because I thought he, he was kind of upset and offended by what I had said. And so, uh, so somehow I think uh, educating uh, some of our, you know, people in high ranking places, whether it's in IHS or other tribal or urban programs uh, is really important. And, uh, and that's why I, uh, I have stayed away from a lot of that over the recent years because and not being involved in specific programs and I can say whatever I want. And, uh, and, and so at this age, uh, hopefully I can say uh, whatever I want. And by the way, I'm just old and I'm not an elder and there's a big difference in that. So I'm just an old guy, okay? <clears throat> so I wanna, <clears throat> you know, cause uh, I told him that the title of this talk is Healing Across 14 Generations and uh, <clears throat> I want to go to kind of to the beginning also of how that started. And so again, uh, jumping around a little bit, kind of being tangential. And, uh, you know, after I got out of the military, um, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And, uh, but uh, at that time, the, the VA would uh, give me $600 a month if I took six units of something. And so, you know, I was taking classes and getting my 600 bucks a month. And, and so pretty soon I had to declare a major and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and so I declared uh, psychology and philosophy and that kind of thing. And, uh, and I was starting to like it. I said, you know, maybe this will help me understand some of the stuff that I've seen in family and in my community. And, uh, and slowly, you know, went and, and, and got a degree and uh, was learning all this Western stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> And then when I uh, got into my doctorate program, I thought, well, now I'm really on my way, you know, to becoming a psychologist and seeing what, what I can offer. But I really had no idea. I thought I was just going to be doing psychology just in a Western kind of um, way. And, and sometimes uh, instead of Western, I say white way. So I hope I don't offend anybody if I say white way, because it also... You know, explains something, you know, explains something about the psychology. And, uh, and it was around the time that I was getting into the doctoral program that I went back to New Mexico. I was living in uh, San Diego, California, where I had been discharged from the military. And my grandpa was really sick. And so I went to see him. And, uh, and, and so I, you know, visiting and he's really not doing well. He's towards the end of, of uh, his journey. And he told me some things. Uh, he told me some stories that were really peculiar and I didn't really understand what he was talking about. And uh, <clears throat> go back to San Diego and I went to a bookstore. This is before Amazon and there was actual bookstores. And so I went to the psychology section and, and I picked out this book written by Carl Jung. And I started looking through it. And, and as I'm looking through it, I saw, well, you know, some of the words here are something like my grandfather was talking about but my grandfather couldn't read or write. So I knew he hadn't read Jung. And so that kind of made me curious. So I bought the book and I said, I'm gonna read this because uh, something's going on here. And so here I'm, uh, at the same time, I'm also working for the Department of Defense as an engineering psychologist. And so what an engineering psychologist does is, is they work uh, and they try to establish a relationship between a human being and a weapon system. And so, uh, so the work has to do with military applications and of course violence and all that. 
So it was at that time that I started getting kind of internally sick and having symptoms of uh, depression, anxiety, and, and that kind of thing. And uh, I, didn't real, I didn't know what was going on and why I was feeling all this. And, and later I found out that it's when you're going against what your spirit wants you to do, sometimes uh, you get sick. And uh, somebody told me that that was called the Indian sickness. And uh, the Indian sickness uh, isn't in a DSM-5 yet, but uh, I predict it'll probably be in the DSM-16 or somewhere along the line. Oh. And, uh, and the Indian sickness is when uh, you have a song to sing and you don't sing it, then it, it makes you sick. <clears throat> And so now, you know, fast forward, get into a doctoral program, minding my own business, you know, struggling and, and really uh, a lot of frustration uh, as to the course material and all that. And uh, it was around that time that uh, I was invited by, um, by a tribal group. And uh, it was a, a, a consortium of, uh, of over 20 tribes. And what they wanted me to do is to develop a mental health program to them. And of course, I had never done any mental health, and hadn't done any therapy. So I said, yeah, I can do this. And so, of course, I started uh, working. And the very first day of work, she had told me that this was going to be really different because I approached, uh, there was a couple of women in charge of the agency. And uh, the first day I went and asked them, and I said, well, uh, where's my office? And they said, well, it's wherever you want it to be. And so I, I then asked, well, what do I do? You know, I was kind of looking for a job description or something like that. And I said, well, you do whatever you want. And they weren't kidding. And so I'm like, man, this is really different because, you know, coming out of the military where everything is linear and you know exactly what's supposed to be happening, even what to wear and all that. Here I'm being told that do whatever you want. <clears throat> And so very quickly, you know, people started coming to me and I was working up in the mountains and my office was actually a, an IHS RV and people were coming to me for help. And of course, uh, I, I, would, I would try to do behavioral interventions, which is what I had been learning in the Department of Defense. And uh, lucky for me, uh, the people in the community rejected that right away. Uh, when I started talking to them in that Western therapeutic way, they said, no, we don't want to hear that. We don't want you to talk to us like that. But that's all I had. And so uh, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really fumbling at that point and, uh, and wondering what to do. And, and people would come to me with a lot of problems, you know, whether it's addictions, violence, you know, sadness, all of that. And I would sit there and try to do behavioral interventions and, and reject and so I'll go back to the tribal council and to the health board and present sort of what I uh, think I'm doing. And the elders in the tribal council also rejected everything I was doing. and said, no, 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 uh, you're talking really wrong here. Everything you think is our problem is not our problem. And so it was at that point that I started thinking, boy, this community's got a lot of denial. <clears throat> and so, uh, but what to do, you know, they're rejecting all my wonderful therapies that I'm learning and, and going into student debt to learn. And, but it was a blessing that they did that, that they rejected everything I had. <clears throat> so it was also around this time that as I'm sitting uh, with people telling me their problems or their pain in, in that truck, you know, where I, where I used to see them, that I started having an experience, a peculiar experience. And, uh, and that experience was that when people were telling, sitting in front of me, you know, as a patient, whether it be one or two or kids with the family, uh, I started having a feeling that there was somebody else in the truck with me. And, and, and of course, it would only happen when people were there talking to me about what was going on with them. And when they left, that would stop. <laughs> And so I, I was really having a hard time figuring out what is this, you know, because I know there's something else here, but I don't know what it is. And I can't very well uh, address it when patients are sitting in front of me because by then I had already kind of taken the ethics course. And of course, in the ethics, um, it says that, you know, the therapist should not be hallucinating in front of their patients, right? And I'm sure all of you know that. 
And so I couldn't very well start going like, whoa, what was that? Because there was something moving in the, in the truck. <clears throat> And so the more it's ha the more I'm trying to use psychology to understand this thing that's going on, the stronger it gets. So at some point, uh, I'm starting to I'm starting to feel a real splitting in me, and a real fear that I was losing it. I was really afraid. That I, I was I was starting to lose my mind, and and I'm losing my mind in front of the people that are asking me for help. And so it was a real scary time in my process of learning how to do this work. And so, uh, so one day, uh, this, uh, this medicine person, this medicine man came in, I knew him by description, I mean, I never met him. And, uh, and, and he happened to be what the anthropologists call uh, a trans doctor. And so what this uh, gentleman would, could do is uh, he would go in what we know as a trance or he would go into another realm and then he could actually tell people what they dream and interpret the dream and then he could do interventions you know he he could doctor people <clears throat> and so i thought you know i can't tell my clinical supervisor what i'm experiencing but i can probably tell this person because if he reports me people aren't going to believe him because you know he doesn't belong to the school or anything like that and once they find out what he does, then they're gonna think, well, that he's crazier than I am. And so I, uh, I proceeded to kind of explain what was going on in my, in my circle, my personal circle, and hoping that he would tell me, well, what you need to do is take time off because you're really stressed out and, and, uh, and, and you need to take some rest. But he didn't do that. He, he told me the exact opposite of what I wanted to hear. And uh, well, well, what I was told was the reason you're experiencing th this feeling is because they are there. And so I'm like, what, who's there? I mean, what, what, is he, what, what are these people talking about? And the explanation came then that, and, and all of you have heard this because uh, this saying, uh, I, I've heard all over the world from indigenous people that everything we do will affect seven generations. So what we're doing here today will affect seven generations. But then what he said is that in spirit time and in dream time, time doesn't have to move just forward. Time can move backwards also. And it can do that at the same time. So, so in spirit, dream time can move backwards and forwards. And that's when he told me that in these communities where I was working, within a 30 year period, 80% uh, of the native people had been exterminated. And so there were complete tribes that no longer existed. Then I, it was explained to me that the only place that we can heal what happens, whether it's in the past or in the future, is in the present moment. And so, the explanation was that what I was experiencing uh, in, the, in the truck when patients were in front of me was the, the visits of the ancestors of the people I was working with who hadn't had the chance to heal from the trauma that was inflicted on them because in that kind of extermination, I mean, you're killed so suddenly that a lot of times people didn't even know they were dead for a long time. And all of a sudden, your spirit is out there flying. He says, and so now, as, as their descendants, as their great-grandchildren were trying to heal themselves, they were also healing themselves in the spirit world. And also, the unborn ones who were hoping that we heal in the present moment were also present so that they don't have to heal when they get here seven generations from now. So that's where the idea of in this present moment, we're healing 14 generations because we're healing seven generations before and, and seven after. And so then the present moment becomes really powerful as far as the, the, the healing that, uh, that we need to do. And uh, over the years, that has been a really important thing to tell the people I work with because a lot of times, uh, you know, people come to see us 
and they're really not that motivated to get better. But when we tell them that they are also healing their great, great, great grandchild, then that becomes really important because nobody, uh, no matter how sick or crazy they are, wants to pass on their sickness to the children. And also they want to heal their great, great grandma or their great, great grandpa. So if they don't care about themselves, they do care about the 14 generations. And so that kind of puts them on the spot to where I, I can tell them, well, you get to choose who is going to carry the sickness that you have three generations from now. And, you know, because this sickness is in movement, remember, it's in motion. And so the sickness has a spirit to it. And so if it has a spirit to it, then it'll be passed on or it'll, or it'll be passed back on up seven generations before. And so that puts a lot of responsibility on the present day uh, patient. And so, so I know um, I said a lot of words there and um, most of those words are probably something that uh, is pretty off the grid for those of you who are um, trained in, the, in, in, this, in, in this particular work. And, and so that was the beginnings of my starting to understand this thing that now everybody talks about, you know, called historical trauma. So it was actual history happening in the spiritual moment and, uh, and what to do with it because I didn't have the context. You know, here I'm learning Western psychology. This guy's telling me that there's this kind of movement happening. And so what I started doing is I started telling the patients that this is what I heard. And so now the patients are saying, finally, you're understanding what we want to talk about. And the other thing that they wanted to talk about was their dreams. And of course, in Western training, there's no training on how to talk about dreams. And at this point, I, I was just telling them, okay, bring your dreams then. And I had no notion as to what to do with them, but uh, they're bringing me uh, notebooks full of dreams. And, and so they would tell me the dream and, uh, and I would just sit there. And of course, in Western uh, psychology, uh, I like to tease people uh, in, in our field. And I say, well, there's only two things you have to know to be a psychologist or a therapist. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> and the first thing you have to know is that when you have no idea what's going on or what to say, which for me is most of the time, um, <clears throat> what we say is, well, what do you think it means? So, you know, the patient tells me this long dream I'm sitting there listening, and, and so then I respond, and I say, well what, well, what do you think it means? And boy, these Indians were really tough, because they, they wouldn't give me no slack. And they said, well, if we knew what it, what, what it meant, we wouldn't be here talking to you, would we? And so now they took that away from me. My, my, the very first technique that I learned in therapy, they took it away. So I, I was left with only one thing then, and all of you know this technique, I'm sure. And again, when we don't know what to do or say in therapy, uh, they teach us to kind of take our hand and kind of put it over here like this and to look uh, kind of real serious over towards the patient and, uh, and to not say anything. But uh, what we do is we go, hmm, like that. And so that kind of tells the patient why wow, they really know what the, what, the, what the dream means, but maybe you're not ready to hear it. And so what it does, it buys you a little bit of time in, in the therapeutic encounter. And so, uh, so that's, uh, you know, what I, was, what I was trying to do, you know, with, with the people there. And, but uh, even though I didn't know how to respond to dreams, what I started finding out is that after a few weeks of me just sitting there, not knowing anything, but just listening to their dreams, that people started getting better. And so people start healing from uh, serious stuff that they were carrying, you know, and some of the people had serious violent stuff, they had serious addiction stuff. And by me just listening to the dreams, they started to heal from whatever was going on with them. And so, uh, of course, now I realize that the dream comes from creator, from the mystery, 
And, and, and that is what really informs us as to what needs to happen. And so if you don't remember anything about what I said today, uh, you know, during the time that we're together, um, I, I hope that you uh, start asking all your patients, you know, what they're dreaming, because everybody's dreaming at least two hours a night. And, uh, and, I, and I say, you know, let's not waste them because that's creator talking directly to the patient. And it's through that conversation the creator is telling the patient that it can form you as the therapist or the healer as to what to do or what to say to this patient as far as their life. And another thing with dreams is that long after they stop seeing you, that person will continue dreaming the rest of their life. And I believe that uh, the dreaming continues even into the spirit world. And as we know, uh, all, all religions, all ceremony, everything, and it doesn't matter what religion you believe in, all of it comes either through a dream or a vision. And so uh, visions and dreams are pretty much uh, part of the same continuum the way I see it. And so if everything has come through the dream, then why not stay with the dream? But again, in the Western training, uh, we are not taught that we dreams might be mentioned maybe for a few seconds but then uh, it's put away as something not important but to uh, at least most or all the people that i've worked with dreams have been of primary importance and i can truthfully say that is where their healing has come from it, it doesn't come from me i'm just there as a sounding board and as I learn more about dreams, then I can at least respond a little bit about what I think the dream might mean. But it's ultimately the dreamer then that is between their relationship between themselves and the sacred and, and the mystery of the dream time, that that helps them to heal themselves. And so uh, again, uh, and, and even in your families, I, I, I highly recommend that every morning, you know, you you ask children, ask your spouses or relatives, did you dream anything last night? Because it, it is that important, you know, every dream is a message from creator. And uh, even though sometimes people think, well, I had a really bad dream. Well, I don't believe there's such a thing as a bad dream because it's, it's all trying to tell us something. And if we consider a dream bad, that could mean that our ego really doesn't want to deal with it and would rather, uh, stay in denial of whatever it is that we're trying to stay in denial about. <clears throat> and let me check the time here because I, I know this, uh, sometimes when I'm talking time shape shifts and before I know it, they say you only got two minutes. And, uh, and so I want to get to a, a couple of other points. And I really want to use a couple of minutes here to honor my root teacher, what I call my root teacher. And it was around this time that I'm really having a really hard time not understanding dreams. People are coming to me that the CHR, the community health worker came up to the truck and she, uh, she tells me, there's this elder that wants to see you. And uh, as soon as she said that, uh, something in me felt, I don't ever wanna see this person. And I had no idea who she's talking about. And so I made up some excuses. Well, I'm kind of busy, you know, I don't have time. So a few days later, she came and she, again, she says, this elder wants to see you. And after three or four times, I said, well, then why doesn't he come to see me? And she says, well, he can't because he's paralyzed. You know, he can't move. He can't come to see you. And, uh, and so that made me really nervous. And now I really didn't want to see him. And so uh, <clears throat> I asked a few questions, you know, because in, when you, when you be, learning to be a therapist, you always want to diagnose everything. And so I wanted to diagnose him, even though I've never seen him. And so thinking, well, if he's paralyzed, he must have some other mental problem going on. And so I said, well, uh, what does he do? You know, thinking maybe he's depressed, anxious, or who knows what. And she says, well, he sits there, or he lays there, and he meditates, and he prays a lot. And a couple of times a year, uh, we take him in his wheelchair, up into the mountains and we leave him there for four days and four nights with no food and water. And, uh, and so I'm thinking right away, I say, oh, no, 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 you, no, you cannot do that. That's elder abuse. You cannot leave this elder out there by himself 
I know food and water, I'm thinking that, but I didn't say it. And so I asked another clinical question. I said, uh, well, what does he do when he's up there? <clears throat> and she responded, she says, well, he sees. And I'm like, well, he sees what? She, and she says, well, he just sees. So now in my clinical mind, I'm starting to think, well, there's probably some kind of psychotic disorder going on because they leave this poor old guy up there in the mountains, no food and water. So he starts hallucinating. So he must have a schizophrenic disorder. So he doesn't need to see me. He needs to see the medical people so they can give him medicine. So he stops seeing. And so that's you know how uh, unaware I was at that point. And, uh, and so uh, one day <clears throat> she just drove her pickup uh, up to the truck where I was working. And, uh, and she says, uh, we're going now. He, he wants to see you and nobody else wants to talk to you today. So what, what she had done is she canceled all the appointments and she says, we're gonna go see Terrence. And so now I'm really nervous. I am having a panic disorder inside, but I'm trying to maintain cool, pretending that I'm okay. So I get in the pickup with her and we go up this mountain road and uh, there's a shack kind of falling down shack up on the hill there and so we get there and so i get out of the truck still pretending that i know what i'm doing and uh, and she just leans it on the driver's side door and she says well he doesn't want to see me he wants to see you and now the panic is really really i'm really nervous i mean i'm sweating i'm shaky because i don't want to go into that shack <laughs> And, and but I, I do because I'm the only mental health person working in the community and I can't say no. So uh, so I walk in there and uh, now my panic is becoming worse because uh, I see, you know, he's he looks kind of like a skeleton almost laying on his bed. And then there's bags collecting body fluids hanging on the side of the bed. And I am totally out of my realm here and the very first words he ever said to me in this lifetime he laughed first he laughed and then he looked at me and he says uh, don't think that way there's other realities and so I'm trying to diagnose him because he said that because in psychology they teach us that if somebody thinks they're reading your mind that means they really got a bad disorder that they're really psychotic or schizophrenic and it's called ideas of reference and so I thought, oh, man, this guy's really scared. But I couldn't hold the thought because something is going on there. And now my panic disorder is, is, is becoming terror. I'm terrified. And as you can see, there's nothing to be terrified about. But my spirit is really afraid. And then he laughs again. And then he, he asked me a question. And he says, have you ever seen the colors? And I'm like, whoa. I can't, I can, that thought is melting my brain because I'm trying to diagnose him, but that he's saying stuff like that to me. And so all I could say is, no, sir, I've never seen the colors. And so then he laughed again and he said, uh, well, you want me to show them to you? And when he asked that question, I almost passed out. I had to hold myself up because I'm, I'm getting real dizzy. And all I could say is, no, sir, I don't want you to show me anything. I went right to the door. And right as I'm about to get outside the little shack there, he, he says, well, I want you to come back and see me. And I'm like, oh, man, I wish he hadn't said that because I don't ever want to see this guy again because he just, you know, terrified me. I almost blacked out in his presence, and I don't even know what's going on. So now I kind of have to, I waited a couple of weeks and I come back to see him for just a little bit longer and left and I came back again. And, and pretty soon I'm starting to get comfortable around him and not so scared. And, uh, and he started to tell me things. He's telling me things that I really am not understanding. Even though he's speaking English, I have no idea what he's talking about. And he's, you know, and he talks and he's interested in what I'm studying and he laughs a lot. And so uh, three years, fast forward three years, you know, of hanging out with him by the, you know, by the end of the first year, I'm getting more comfortable. I have an affection for him. I'm, I'm really, I really like him, but I don't, don't understand him. <clears throat> so it was around June 19th of 1983, somewhere in there <clears throat> that I went up to see him. And uh, when I 
got up to the shack. He's uh, he's sitting on a wheelchair out on his porch, and he's wearing a brand new headband and a, a brand new Pendleton shirt, and he's sitting very elegant up there somehow in his, in his wheelchair. You know, he was kind of tied in. And I thought, well, I never seen him like that. I wonder why he's doing, why he's sitting like that. And so, you know, he's sitting here. And so there's a steps over here. So I sit on the steps, you know, lower than the wheelchair. And we're both facing the same direction. And uh, on that day, <clears throat> <clears throat> he proceeds to talk in, uh, in very rational terms. And he, uh, he, he's telling me, um, how how he sees reality but he's saying it in a way that i understand it's rational and and i'm wondering what well, this old guy's been messing with my head for three years he could have talked to me like this the first time instead he waited three years to mess with me and uh, so i got a little bit resentful so after however long i was there i was there a long time i uh i left and uh and so two days later, which happens to be the solstice, the summer solstice, uh, he had one of his family members bring in his uh, pipe, his chanupa. And, uh, and when he smoked that pipe, he expelled himself into the spirit world. And so it was then that I knew uh, who he was, that I had been in the presence of a holy man for three whole years. And I had no idea who he was until now he expelled himself into the spirit world and so what i realized then is that that last time we talked on june 19th or whenever is that he gave me what i call the rosetta stone or the map to understand whatever he had been talking about for the previous three years <clears throat> because he realized that i wasn't understanding what he was talking about that uh, that i was a slow learner and he knew that he was going to be leaving in a couple of days. And so, uh, so what he needed to do is to uh, give me something so that I could decipher what he'd been talking about. And, uh, and so he did that on that day. <clears throat> and then another thing that I realized is that it was during uh, the first few seconds in his presence that he actually gave me that spiritual transmission. He, gave, he taught me everything I needed to know the first 30 seconds, but he did it spiritually. And that's when he basically, he, he just shot into me. And because I had no idea what was going on, that's when I almost blacked out because it was too much that he threw on me in, in the very first moment. And then he took the rest of the three years to help me out. And so he basically contained me so that I wouldn't lose it because, you know, what he was saying spiritually was just too much for my mind at the time, who really, which really didn't have the understanding. And so uh, <clears throat> I, call, <clears throat> I, I, I call his teachings, you know, as my root teacher because uh, even sometimes when I'm doing a talk like today, I'll say things that I really hadn't said ever before. And I realized, oh, that came from his teaching that finally is coming through in, in an understandable way. And so there's a, a whole different way of, uh, of understanding <clears throat> reality. <clears throat> and so I just need to tell you that because it's important, you know, in the white world, <clears throat> when we talk or we write papers, we have to give references, right? As to where, where'd you learn that? Well, I just want to let you know sort of where I learned it. And uh, and so I learned it from him, Terrence, and also from my patients, and then from other elders and teachers. Uh, some of you, some of them have been in your audience this week, you know, like my brother Richard Moosecamp, you know, Rick and, and Ethelene Two Dogs, and, and of course Jake Little Thunder, who for many years would just take me aside every time I was there, uh, you know, for a ceremony. And he would just take me aside and just talk to me for a long time. And he would just tell me things. And uh, a lot of them were just really fine things about the ceremony. And, uh, and I'm so grateful, you know, that he took that time. And, uh, 
and he's always in my heart, you know, I just have a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of affection for, for Grandpa Jake and how he, he just took me, you know, aside and then did that for whatever reason. I mean, uh, he just did it. <clears throat> so uh, now I want to talk about uh, some of the difference between uh, white world understanding of trauma and some of the Indian way of understanding trauma that I understand. <clears throat> and <clears throat> as you all know, the trauma and kind of the Western medical model which is the model that all of us are trained in, whether you're a social worker, psychologist, substance abuse, whatever. It all comes down from the medical model and it all comes down from Western philosophy. And, and it's that philosophy of separation. <clears throat> and so when we start talking about trauma, which by the way, uh, PTSD, uh, those letters don't really mean anything to most native people or to even white people. And I asked uh, <clears throat> this one Nez Perce brother who happened to be a psychologist, uh, he asked the elders from uh, his community how they, how they understood uh, trauma or PTSD. And, uh, and, and they, they said these words to him that I, that I keep using. And they said, it's, it's injury where blood doesn't flow. That's what PTSD is. So it's, it's a very different understanding of that because PTSD doesn't mean anything, it's just four letters. And so, so we start talking about trauma, it's important that we decolonize it. Because I, I, I heard that word a lot here the last couple of days, but we need to decolonize at a really deep level. We need to decolonize at the very basic understanding of what it is that we're doing. And, and I really am so grateful to the people I just mentioned, the teachers that I've had for the last 40 years <clears throat> to where it's been taught that you need to decolonize before the concept even happens. And so that's how far back we need to do that. And so when we talk about trauma in a Western way that teaches that trauma happens when uh, you know there's a physical event that hurts the body. And of course, when the body is hurt, the mind sometimes is also hurt. And so now we need to heal the body and then we need to do kind of psychotherapy to heal the mind. And, and so that should do it. But very early on in my work, I saw I'm doing all that, but people are still suffering. They're still not well. You know, they're still sad. There's still a lot of anxiety. And a lot of them are resorting to using the spirit of alcohol, the spirit of marijuana, the spirit of heroin, meth, whatever spirit they want to use. And so something's missing here. You know, everything I've been taught, there's something that's not working because I was doing the best therapy I knew how, and we had the best physicians doing the body work. And so what to do now, because it's not working. And, and some people I was seeing were already in their seventies and had been suffering their whole life. They have been getting a lot of medical care a lot of uh, counseling, a lot of that, and still suffering. And so in my simple mind, I, I like to ask simple questions. And a lot of people say they're stupid questions, but those are my favorite. And so my simple question was, must be something, is there something else going on? So go back to the teachings of Terence. <clears throat> and so one of the things he said, everything has a spirit to it. And everything means everything, whether it's uh, objects that we don't think are alive or things that are alive, but also mental or energies that come from human beings also have a spirit to them. <clears throat> and so the understanding here is that when somebody who's going to commit violence or commit a trauma, cause trauma or injury where blood doesn't flow, to someone is that they have to have a, a thought or an intention in their heart mind. So that intention in a heart mind has a lot of energy to it. And in, in, in the Chinese tradition, we call it qi. In the martial arts, we, we talk about qi and qi, which is life force. So in the spirit of that perpetrator, there's that qi or spirit force. So, so they do the physical act 
of hurting and of course the psychological act, but then there's also a spiritual transmission that happens. And this is where the spirit of the perpetrator is shot into the victim. And so in the very next in-breath that the victim does, you know, out of fear, they, they take in the spirit of the perpetrator. So now the spirit of the perpetrator is in them. And according even to Western psychology, you know, Carl Jung, he teaches that if there's, he uses the word complex, but he actually meant spirit. So if there's a complex or a spirit that has entered you and you don't do anything about it, then that complex or spirit develops a life of its own in the unconscious or what I call the black world, because the black world is that unseen world that we all have. And so now it's growing in there. And so it's creating a problem. And in the way that it tells it that it's, that it's a problem is through symptoms. And so this is where the sadness, the anxiety, and the wanting to do a, a substances, because the longer we ignore it, the stronger it gets. <clears throat> And, but then uh, there's something we call an ego. You know, this is where the person relates to the world from whatever they have learned in this life. And a lot of times the mind of the person who's suffering realizes that there's something here and I got to get rid of it. But because we have forgotten the original teachings, we don't know what that is. And again, because we don't know the, the original teachings, we think that by killing this thing that has entered us, then we'll be okay. And so there's a, you know, two main kinds of people and, uh, you know, and kind of in the psychological world. And, and then, you know, one type of people are the more introverted people. And these are people that are very quiet and, and keep things to themselves. And so when they have a injury where blood doesn't flow and a, and a negative spirit enters from the perpetrator and trying to get rid of it and trying to kill it, the only way that they know how to do that is by doing self-destructive behaviors. And these are the behaviors that all of you work with. And this is whether it's substance abuse, depression, suicidal ideation. In my understanding, the this is a... a a misunderstanding of the individual as to how to get rid of this and is to kill it because in, in their Western colonized mind, that is a way that we know to, to get rid of things. But the natural law says you can't do that because you cannot create or destroy energy or matter and you can't get rid of it because if you try to push it away, again, it goes against the natural law. Because the natural law says that for every reaction, every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So if we push against this disorder or this suffering, it's going to push back. And, and that's just the way it is. That's how the universe is wired. That's not my theory. That's just, uh, you know, Isaac Newton, you know, big English guy back in the 1600s, whenever he, he talked about the... <clears throat> you know, the opposite and equal reaction. And of course, in physics, they tell us we, we cannot create energy or matter. So then we shouldn't even try it because it doesn't work. And then going back to the other personality, and there's people in the world that are extroverts, right? And you know some people like that who always project stuff and they're always talking and they're always thinking of something outside themselves. So when one of these individuals gets shot with a negative energy of the perpetrator, what they try to do is they project it and they project it onto the outside world. And this is where we get things in our communities, something called domestic violence. You know, and domestic violence was pretty much unheard of before colonization. So it means or lateral violence. We hear that a lot also, you know, where internalized aggression where we read on red violence, you know, where native on native violence, well, it's, it's coming from somewhere. And it's coming from the spirit of the perpetrator. And, and it's really important to note that the, uh, the perpetrator could be personal violence 
or it could be a collective violence. So it could be a violence against the whole community. And so this is where in communities, we need to know who the perpetrator of the big violence was. And of course, up here in the Plains area, it's kind of easy to call that one because we can say, well, Custer, you know, he was the main perpetrator of that because he had an intention in his heart mind to destroy native people. So he basically did a big sorcery into where he shot that energy into a lot of people. And so it's that energy that sometimes makes us go against each other. And so, so that's kind of the, uh, my understanding. And, and early on, what gave me the notion that it was that it was when uh, working with people who had uh, serious violence in their personal life, and, and you probably have seen this, but then they feel real guilty about it. Even though they didn't do it, they still feel the guilt. And so that's where I asked another simple question. Well, what is that? Or where is the guilt coming from? Well, the guilt is, is attached to the spirit of the perpetrator that has entered the person. Because a perpetrator, even though they might be a real sick individual, they still have aspects of the natural law that governs them. So at some level, they know that this isn't right. And they have a guilt, but they haven't, but they haven't learned how to deal with that. Because they haven't learned, you know, that it's not a good thing to hurt people or to hurt beings. And the other thing that I hope stays with you <clears throat> is that in, uh, <clears throat> when violence is committed against a human being or against any being, because we are not separate from the earth, that violence is also done to the earth. And so the earth has been really, really uh, violated. And so our earth you know, is suffering injury where blood doesn't flow also, because we are the earth and we drink the water from the earth, we eat the food from the earth. So if we're eating food and drinking water from the earth that has trauma, well, we're eating trauma. And if we're taking in trauma, then it's gonna create problems in our bodies. And so that's where a lot of sicknesses come from. And that's why it's so important to bless food before we eat it, right? Because if we bless it, then we can undo some of the trauma. And if we bless it in a way with the understanding that we are blessing the trauma that was put in our food, then we can start to neutralize that. And an example of that is, uh, you know, working with diabetes or the spirit of diabetes over the years is that... Uh, it occurred to me that it came from somewhere because looking at uh, pictures and, uh, and, and understanding from like even just 100 years ago or let's say 120 years ago, there was almost zero diabetes in Indian country. Nobody had it. But then all of a sudden, <clears throat> there was a lot of it. <clears throat> so where did it come from? Well, my understanding is that there was a big sorcery done. And so that sorcery, uh, at least one of the main sorcerers was somebody called General Sherman. Because General Sherman was the general that was appointed, um, I forget which year, to, to take care of the so-called Indian problem. <clears throat> but General Sherman's way of doing war uh, and, and history shows this, was to just destroy everything. His way of doing war is, is kill everything, just burn everything on your path. But at that point, they, they told him, well, you can't do that, you know, because there was already some folks uh, in the white world who were thinking, this is not good. We can't be just genociding Native people. You have to try something else. And so that's when he came up with a policy of uh, what he said, uh, well, then let's destroy their commissary. And, and that's military jargon for food supply. So in his mind, in his spirit, he had an intention to destroy our food. And this is where the destruction of the buffalo, uh, all other food sources, 
people were moved to different parts of the country where they didn't understand, you know, what the land produced. And so basically there was a curse that General Sherman shot into our food supply. And so it's really important to understand the beginning of that so that we can start undoing it and so that we can start blessing the food all the way back to seven generations as to when General Sherman or other people like him came into our communities to shoot this negative energy, which I call a negative sorcery and an evil sorcery. And so uh, a lot of it comes from, uh, from people like that. And when I go to work in communities, wherever, whether it's in Canada, here or New Zealand, I, I like to ask people, well, who did this to you? And of course, a lot of them say, well, I don't know, somebody did. And, but now we have the, uh, everybody has a phone in their pocket and in there, there's a Google machine, right? <clears throat> and so I said, well, why don't you look it up? And within a few seconds, people can find out exactly who it was that brought this negative energy into their community, whether it was the boarding schools or there was some other war kind of act. We can actually name the person and go back seven generations then and try to undo the sorcery that that person brought into our communities. <clears throat> it is really important to do that because if we don't, what happens with our uh, mental health systems that we have and, and in a diagnostic process is that in telling a native person that they have all kinds of things wrong with them, you know, like uh, addiction, you know, diabetes, you got this, you got that, Basically, we're telling that individual, you're just a defective human being. And, then, and of course, there's nothing you, you can do with that. <clears throat> but if we say, somebody brought this into your lineage, and there's this energy that somebody brought in, now that individual knows they're not defective, and that they're just reacting to some historical event that happened. And so that's very liberating. And that's why I call a, a lot of the work that I've been doing, I call it liberation psychology, liberation discourse. And, and it's through that liberation psychology that we can start decolonizing. Because the very first thing we need to do is tell that individual that you are not defective, that anybody who has gone through what you have gone through in your generations is going to react exactly the same way because you're a human being and that's how human beings react and and that really releases the person from thinking they're just a bad individual and now there's space to heal because now they're liberated from that i mean they can still have responsibility for their actions but it's really a different kind of responsibility because now that is in the healing mode instead of being I'm just a bad guy and because of that I'm going to go to hell or whatever other uh, thing has been put into the colonized mind of the poor person and so hopefully that idea stays with you all who are working with our relatives from, from day to day <clears throat> let me check the time again <clears throat> yeah we're getting on to uh, a half hour left and I, I was uh <clears throat> hoping that if somebody had, because I've said some things that are pretty off the track here. So if anybody has questions or, uh, or words, uh, I would appreciate it so we can address it right away. And you don't walk away thinking, well, but like I guy said a lot of crazy stuff and uh, we don't know if, if it makes any sense or not. So uh, I don't know how the uh, questions, I guess, will come up in the chat or, or whatnot. But uh, they're always appreciated if, if, there are, if there are some. And so I'll just uh, pour me a, a little bit more sage and honey tea here. And, uh, and that way my voice can continue. Yes, sir. Eduardo, we, we got one question here. Okay. Can you hear us? Okay. Are you implying that you were gifted? Uh, <clears throat> that you were given? The question was, is, are you implying that you were gifted a gift through your abilities? Uh, did, uh, did I find what now? Take your mask off. 
go ahead and ask me again. Okay. I said, are you implying that you were gifted a gift and abilities? Um, no, I'm not implying uh, anything like that at all. No, I'm just a regular pitiful human being. Actually, <laughs> actually the, the most unshika of anybody else. And so, uh, yeah, but I've been blessed in that my teachers have told me some things. And uh, over the 35 years that I have been doing this, uh, it seems that uh, a lot of the people that I work with, what, I to what I've been talking to you all has made sense. Of course, I'm telling you all this stuff all at once, which is kind of a lot, but in working with a patient, you know, it goes slow, right? You meet them and then you work on stuff. And then if the patient is really colonized, I don't tell them this stuff right away because they're going to run away. <laughs> you know, a lot of Native people have really internalized the white thing. And so if I start talking about this stuff, they're going to say, no, give me, I want to see another therapist. And so we got to go really slow and listen to the dreams and slow. And, and it, so it becomes a decolonizing process in working with the patient in the here and now. And so uh, if, there, if there is a gift, then it's a gift from the mystery to the patient. And, uh, and that's why I'm holding this hollow bone here, because I really believe in the teaching that uh, um, Gaka uh, full scroll talked about right and he he said it very straight up he says if you're a hollow bone basically take all your ego out of the way that is the only way that creator is going to come and, and do the healing so all i try to do and as much as i can become a hollow bone and that's why i hold this as a reminder constantly when i work with people i'll, I'll have this in my pocket in case i forget and I start thinking that I'm gifted. Well, as soon as I think I'm gifted, uh, that's the end of that. That's my ego. And so if I know that this hollow bone is there, then I'm not anything. And so uh, hopefully you all can, uh, can also work within that understanding. And so uh, sister that asked the question, uh, you know, you seem like you're young enough to have a long life of doing this work and so if you don't remember any other crazy stuff i said today just remember well it's not even what i said it's what uh you know grandpa fool's girl talked about and uh it's, it's really amazing you know what can happen when you get out of the way <clears throat> and so <clears throat> so no gifts um just uh like i said just a common person who who has been blessed in this lifetime to be in the presence of real holy people like my original teacher. And uh, I can't be grateful enough to the creator for, and of course I had no idea he was holy because most holy people don't tell you they're holy, right? Because it, it, once they tell you they're holy, the holiness goes away. And so, <laughs> so that's, uh, thanks. So another one? Yeah, uh, we got another question here. Yo. <clears throat> yeah, I'm wondering about uh, your liberation psychology. Is there uh, anything that you've published on that? Or are there some frameworks or models? I, He's I'm asking a question about your liberation psychology and if you have any frameworks, models, or publications available. Um, well, just what I'm telling you today, <clears throat> you know, and uh, I think I wrote about it in the uh, second edition of uh, Healing the Soul Wound. And I'm not here to promote books or anything, but uh, I can show it to you. Um, this came out, uh, came out uh, last year or so. And, uh, and in there, I talk about how, because you know, in, in academia, there's a lot of talk now about post-colonial this, post-colonial discourse, and that's all good to decolonize. But I think in the process of decolonizing, it's that liberation that happens to where now we're allowed to regain our identity. And, and, uh, and, and identity is, is really crucial because I really believe that a lot of the suicidal ideation or, or completed suicides that happen in our communities are the lack of identity and if, if, there's, if there's no one there, then it's real easy to kill yourself because you're not killing anything because 
you're not there anyway in the first place. And so in liberation help, what we do is we try to restore the identity of the person by using uh, traditional ideas in the therapy. You know, like instead of saying PTSD, for instance, injury where blood doesn't flow. Well, to, to a colonized native who's never heard that, that's going to make an impact. They say, what are you talking about? And over the years, when, uh, when I talked this way to some of our native uh, people in therapy, uh, you, know, you know, what they asked me is something uh, peculiar. They said, well, are you like a real psychologist? <laughs> Because they think I'm talking crazy. And so usually, you know, we have to have our diplomas on the wall. I'll point at them. And there's one young woman, when I pointed at my diploma, she says, uh, well, you could have got those anywhere. <laughs> so she, she didn't believe I was a real psychologist. So that's, that's the biggest compliment anybody can give me, by the way. So thank you for your presentation. Um, we're at closing now. We're going to have, like she, Dickie, do the closing and then... Uh, First, we're gonna do some drawings for everyone in attendance. So we really wanna thank you, Mr. Eduardo Duran. Thank you very much. Oh, you mean, you mean uh, this is it? I don't get to yeah. talk. Oh. Yeah, you're five minutes over actually. Oh, geez. <laughs> and sorry, I, I should have let you know ahead of time. I apologize. Yeah. Well, I, I still had two days to go, but that's Oh cool. man, <laughs> one more question. Okay, one more fast question, she said. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so Dr. Duran, um, I used your book. I taught at Oglala Lakota College and taught about the Native American psychology. And I used your book, uh, Post Colonial uh, Psychology. And in there, I was very, very um, a uh, real enthrall, you know, just being having really a lot of um, good thoughts about the kinds of things that you wrote about and talked, you know, I could actually hear you talking sometimes about these things because you go into detail. And I like the way that you do your stories, put them, putting them into perspective for those of us who I really want to dig deep into those things or really need to because that we need to because I was teaching psychology and I always loved the idea of psychology and I wanted to major in that at one point and I um, I got to teach some of the psychology at Blackfield State College and there is where my interest grew and grew and so I really wanted to thank you for being a Native American um, uh, author of a book. Oh. I'm very pleased with that. And you know, my students really enjoyed my lectures, even though they were out of your book. Yeah. It would, I, I put it into perspective for them. So yeah, I, that's what I, Pila Maya. Oh, yeah, and uh, thank you so much for the words. That means a lot. And I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, there's actually a funny story about that book. And I don't know if I, if the brother will give me one minute. Uh, I was at, I was at this Sundance, you know, Brother Richard Moose Camp Sundance, and uh, I was back there in the back, and a lot of the dancers were were out, you know, suffering. And then I heard I, I heard uh, a, a, a whisper from one of the places there, and, and it says, uh, "Hey, Duran." I'm like, "Whoa." Who's talking yet? Because I couldn't see anybody. He said, hey, Duran. I finally looked and there was his brother half passed out. And he says, uh, I'm the only one that understands you, he said. And I said, you do? He says, yeah. He said, I've been reading that book, the book you mentioned. He says, and I understand you and thank you. And so, true story. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much, you all. And uh, prayers and uh, blessings on all that you do. And honored to be in your presence today. And thank you so much. So I uh hope. -huh. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ed. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your teachings. Very valuable. Thank you.
we're going to do a drawing and then we're going to do a close out. So I think the status is right now we're handing out tickets for the drawing, right, David? Okay. Okay. So brand new ticket. You got to have new tickets. Surveys, you probably want to give them to Kaylin or uh, Annie. Annie up here up front. So please do your surveys. It's going to help us to adjust the conference. We're already set for uh, next, next year. 13. <laughs> We're set for next year, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of the L and I. And we may even pull into Denver March. Who knows? Might plan that too. Yeah. You guys want to come if we do? Yeah. Yeah. Denver March Power. We're thinking about it. So I know that we got a large response. My vote so. store price might be a tea package. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Yeah. All right. We need you, Andy. <laughs> so, uh, we just want to let you guys know we thank you for bearing with us. It's been a long few days. And I really feel like drained because hearing these topics and learning about these topics, it's a different type of energy. And I, I just recommend some self-care for you guys because we're we're the ones that are helping the people. So when you take that energy, you really like vicarious traumatization, secondary traumatization, we learned about that. Um, you know, the helper has to be healed too, right? We have to have, we can only take who we're working with as far as we are. So recommend that you get some uh, nice sleep and some exercise, some good food, and then uh, we'll go on to do the drawing here in a little bit. So, yeah, that self care is very important. So, take care and don't chew no be out while you're Christmas shopping. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, you know, you still owe her a prize from the other day. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. Won yesterday. Oh, okay. Uh, here. Yeah. So we've got which one? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. 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 Two twenty-five, the fifties, and two more twenty-five, and then the last fifty. All right. So, what about yesterday? Do we take care of the ones that went? We need two for the other day. Yesterday, right? All right. Okay, so you have to make a re-announcement. Just kidding. So we'll do drawing for two twenty-five, and then drawing for two fifty. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Cross your fingers. Here we go. Twenty-five. Yes. Yeah, so six nine seven nine zero five eight.
Okay, no. This is my dear Mushke. Yes, you're communicating for a little bit. 